just so easy to forget that not only are we saved by grace, but we are sustained by grace. It's God's grace that keeps us. Um, many times we just think of grace as something at the front, but grace goes all the way through salvation. And uh, if it were not for grace, not one of us could be saved. And if it were not for grace, not one of us could remain saved. Uh, if it were not for grace, we don't even deserve the breath that we're taking right now. And so grace is a wonderful, wonderful subject. We ought to think about on it. We ought to preach on it often. And churches need it. Uh, I've met over the years many Christians. I believe many Christians would rather live by guilt than grace. You say, preacher, that sounds crazy. Well, I don't know. It's just human nature, I reckon. But what's ironic is when you run into those who are living by guilt rather than grace, they always want to put that on someone else. They want someone else to feel as bad as they do. Give me an amen or an oh my. And so when you are filled with the knowledge of God's grace, it changes everything. It changes how you live. It changes how you feel. It, it, it puts joy in your tank because grace is what sustains us, uh, and not only what saves us, but it's what sustains us. I want you to look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 12. And notice how the Apostle Paul talked about grace. Now, this was a subject very close to his heart, and I want you to notice how many times he gives God praise. And that's how I titled this, the praise. There's great power in grace, but I want to tell you, when you understand and come to know the power that's in grace, you begin to praise God for it. So he says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for he, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was before, that's him, Paul saying, that's me. I was before a blasphemer and a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant. Turn to your neighbor and say, that means a bunch. Yeah, in our language, that means a bunch. The grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Christ, Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering or patience. For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And Father, we do give you honor. We give you glory. Father, we pray that you would just enlighten our minds and our spirits and our hearts this morning as we ponder on this wonderful subject, this subject that has no depth, Lord, there's no bottom to the grace that you have shown us when you gave your only begotten son. And Father, we just pray that we could be not only recipients of this grace, but expressors, not only possessors, but expressors to other people, Lord, that, that we would show this grace, that we would live and model and be more like Jesus each day. We give you all the praise and all the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul spent three years preaching at Ephesus. Uh, it was one of his crowning moments, if you will. Uh, God used him to plant these churches throughout Asia Minor, and he leaves the church in great hands, if you will. It was in a young man named Timothy, and it's to Timothy he writes this morning. It's a letter, if you will, of encouragement as the aged 
the older apostle uh, is mentoring the younger. He's wanting to encourage him. He's wanting to uh, lift him up, if you will, with this letter. And so he writes Timothy, and much of this letter is encouragement. Much of it's instruction, no doubt. We, we use this uh, letter in the churches today. Uh, there's much instruction. There's much um, that we can glean. And as we find our way through this world, it's the word of God. And therefore, we see how God worked in that early church, and he still works in his church today. But it's a letter challenging Timothy. Not only is it instruction, but it's a challenge. It challenges Timothy to continue to grow in the Lord. Just because you, you may be 50 years in the Lord, you may be up in years in physical age, but God is not finished with you yet. And I can say that with all authority because if he were, you would be in heaven. Can I get an amen? And there's a reason we are here. And Paul is writing to Timothy, and God is using him. And Timothy's going to challenge, I mean, Paul's going to challenge Timothy to continue to grow in the Lord, and particularly to grow in grace. To grow not only in the truth of God's word, but to grow in grace in spite of all the opposition. In spite of all that which comes against him, and believe me, it was not an easy battle living in, in that day. There was much persecution, and these, these Bible writers, these uh, witnesses for the Lord, they, they uh, faced some pretty <coughs> tremendous uh, opposition. And, and, and so Paul's writing, and then Paul begins to give his own testimony. And that's what fascinates me about this verse. The Apostle Paul reminds Timothy that it wasn't it always easy uh, on his part either. And he starts at the front when Paul was a persecutor of the church. Now, I want to tell you, I've met a lot of Christians. Do you know when you get a hold of grace, you're not ashamed of your past in the sense that you won't share it with someone? I've met many, many Christians who want to just wipe out their past. They don't want to talk about it. Uh, but I want to tell you something. My past, I'm not giving myself the glory. I'm giving God the glory for what he brought me from and where he's taken me to. And you can use your past to reach someone else who might be there right now. And so Paul is using his past example. It was a negative. It was certainly not in the positive column. It was in the negative side. And he's saying, Timothy, if God can do this for me, he can do it for you. If God can do this for me, he can do it for anyone. And so Paul is writing and telling this young man, listen, the point is that the change that Jesus accomplished in Paul is not anything to do with Paul. It has nothing to do with who Paul was or who he is. It has to do with who God is. Now, someone once said this, grace is God doing for me what I could never have done for myself. Paul said, I am what I am all by the grace of God. I am all that I am. Grace is God doing for us what we could never have done for ourselves, and we're forgiven by grace, but I want you to see we're also supposed to be living by grace. And so that's what I want to preach. I want to preach on this passage as the Apostle Paul teaches us. The first thing I see, beginning in verse 12, is this testimony he gives. It's my favorite part, honestly. Uh, Paul gives his testimony, and we have a testimony as well. Many Christians have written their testimonies out. Um, you would be surprised how God can use your testimony. If you were to take time and, and a testimony is simply this. This is who I was. This is where I was when Jesus found me. But this is who I'm becoming today. And all the glory goes to God. And, and, and so Paul's writing his testimony and 
you ought to pray and I ought to pray about sharing ours. I'm, I'm always careful uh, as a preacher, been here a long time. I don't want to bore you with my testimony because I've given it so many times to many of you. But I'm never surprised when I give my testimony and someone comes to me and says, I've never heard that. That happened to me just recently. I gave my testimony on an evening service and somebody came to me and said, man, I've never heard that. Thank God, uh, he said, for you sharing that with me. And God can use your testimony as well. Paul gives a testimony of grace. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, verse 12, who hath enabled me. The ability that you have and the ability that I have, the enablement that we have, it comes from God. Grace is acknowledging that it's all from God. Jesus taught us that there's nothing good except God. So when they called him good teacher, remember that? The rich young ruler, I, I believe it was, it even said good teacher. He says, why do you call me good? Jesus was fishing in this man's mind and in this man's heart to get him to understand something. The only person that is good is God. Because we are sinners, and we have sin in us. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. They all seek their own way. The prophet Isaiah said that, for all of us like sheep have gone astray. And so the only righteous person is God himself. And so when, they, when this Pharisee or, or this legalist looked at Jesus and called him good teacher, Jesus said, why do you call me good? Because God is the only one good. And Jesus is God. And that was his point. And so Paul is writing. He's saying, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me. He has given me everything. All the, all the strength, all the glory goes to God. For that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now, I want to pause there for just a moment because... You have a ministry. You say, preacher, um, I understand as a pastor you have a ministry, but I want to tell you, as a Christian, we all have ministries. God has called us into his ministry. And so our ministries are different. They, they differ by whatever gift God has given us. If you have Jesus Christ in your heart, God has given gifted you to serve him. He, is, he has given you a spiritual gift. And here's the point. He will hold you to an account of how you use that gift, whether faithful or whether unfaithful. And Paul says, I praise God. I thank God that not only he enabled me, but he found me faithful and he gave me this ministry. And the ministry came. Paul was an apostle called by God. But it, it, it was all coming, it, it was all God's plan. Now he goes in verse 13, and he's going to talk about his past. He says, as good as all that sounds, that God called me, that God enabled me, that God is keeping me and calling and found me faithful and keeping me faithful, all of that's good. But he says, listen to who I once was. You can imagine God doing that for somebody who deserves it. Amen. And by the way, not one of us deserves it. We might think in our minds, I can imagine God being like this to someone who's earned it. Not one of us can earn it. That's grace. But Paul says, listen to this. God did all of this for me, and I was before a blasphemer. You know what a blasphemer is? Someone who denies that Jesus is God. Someone who... Uh, is just so outrageous with untruth that the Bible calls this blasphemy. And Paul says, that's who I was. Why would he say that? Well, he didn't accept the Lord Jesus Christ, did he? He was persecuting the church who were receiving Christ as their Savior. He says, that's who I was. I was a persecutor. Injurious, that 
that's a word showing that he didn't stop at just words. He actually was part of the physical harm that came upon people. I often, you know, when I was in school, they always tell you, well, the thorn in the flesh was uh, an eye impairment. He says, look with what large letters I use when I write and must have had bad eyesight. The point is that I'm making no one knows. No one knows what Paul's thorn in the flesh was, that thing which he pleaded three times to God, that God would take it. And you know what God's answer was? No. For my grace is sufficient. God was using an injurious, painful episode in Paul's life, whatever it was, to be a thorn in his flesh, to cause him to come to the Lord on his knees and stay there and seek the Lord. And, and, and so God says, my grace is sufficient. But not only uh, can God use these injuries in our lives, but Paul felt the responsibility of his part in others' lives. I often wondered if his thorn was not the memory of Stephen looking to heaven and saying, Father, forgive them, they know not what they're doing while Paul held the coats and they stoned Stephen to death. He says, I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, I was injurious to others, but I obtained mercy. Now, many people put a lot in this last statement. He says, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I want to tell you something. Even if Paul did it willingly, God can still forgive. Amen? And he does. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know who you're dealing with. Uh, maybe you have someone that you're praying for. Maybe it's you. Uh, many times it's us. But I don't care where you've been. Jesus will take you where you are. And he will take you to a future that only he knows. And I want to tell you, the Apostle Paul has given us a testimony here, and it, 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 it's a testimony that says, this is who I once was, but this is who I became. And all of the glory goes to Jesus. All, all of the honor goes to God, uh, to God. I want you to look, first off, this uh, testimony. It's full of thanksgiving. You know how I know when people are full of grace? They're always giving thanks to God. And the opposite is true. You know how you know when people aren't full of grace? You, you never hear them giving thanks to God. It's always about them. Or it's always about, you ask them, how you doing? Oh, well, you know. And then everybody runs, right? Everybody wants to get away. The person that's full of grace is always saying, God is good. No matter what. God has been good. And I want to tell you, no matter if my life were to completely fall apart today, I can say this with all authority and with all my ability. God has been good to me. And he always will be. He's always good. Paul's testimony was full of thanksgiving. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, my Lord, our Lord. And that's the first thing I notice. When our lives are touched by God's grace, we will be filled with thanksgiving. Remember when Jesus healed the people and no one came back to give him thanks except one? And so when we're filled with thanks, it's a testimony that we are understanding it's all by God's grace. Someone says grace is like breathing. Every time you take a breath, you're breathing by grace. But you ought to exhale thanksgiving. Every breath you take ought to give a thank you, if you think about it. And so God is just working through the Apostle Paul. And today is one of the most confounding days that I can think of because this world seems to be, has no thanks for God. As a matter of fact, all I ever see is, it, it seems like there are fists in, in the air towards God, towards God's word, towards God's people. And there's this unthankfulness. And I want to tell you, it's a day we're also 
Well, there's this unthankfulness, there's unhappiness, there's unholiness. And so God is uh, calling this world to repentance. It's all by grace. Paul's testimony was first a uh, testimony of grace, but I want you to also notice he also gives God all of the glory. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, my Lord, who hath enabled me. He counted me faithful, and he put me into this ministry. Paul is not serving the Lord because he has to. Paul is serving the Lord because God called him, and Paul, want, Paul loves serving his Lord. I want to tell you, uh, when you're full of grace, you will love doing the work that Jesus has called you to do. I've said this before. I, I can't express it well enough. Um, I always like to do it when my family's here, uh, cousins and such, because they've known me all my life, and, uh, you know, family reunions and all that. But um, I always got beat up for a big mouth. Uh, got a brother back in the sound room back there. He's laughing right now because he was one of the ones that did it most of the time. But... Um, um, I always wondered what my lot in life was. And I want to tell you, when, when God got a hold of me, when, when I found the Lord Jesus, and I preached my first sermon, I'll never forget going home to my mom and saying, you know, I finally realized why I'm here. What God created. I cannot tell you what wonderful feeling that is to know that you're created for a purpose. To know that God has a ministry for you. And when you plug into that, I can't describe the feeling. The, um, it, it, it's just, it, it, everything makes sense. And so Paul is here and he's given us this testimony. He says, I thank God for it, but I give the Lord all of the glory. He gave the Lord the glory for his gift. He's called to be an apostle. Uh, everyone here this morning has this spiritual gift. 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, I believe it is, or maybe it's 12. But uh, that these spiritual gifts are used in the church. And by the way, this church and every church is no stronger than the members of that church who will use their gift for God's glory. He gave God the glory for the strength that he had. He says, he hath enabled me. Uh, Paul is talking uh, ab about something that it takes years to learn for some of us. Many times, I can't tell you how many times um, I didn't spend enough time in prayer. And I step out into the ministry or step into a pulpit to preach the word of God. And you're not prayed up. You can have all the eloquence in the world. Someone may say it was a good speech. <laughs> but I want to tell you, until God gets it and anoints it and uses it for his glory, it'll never have the effect that it's supposed to have. Maybe you're here this morning and God's touching your heart. Maybe he's using some of this to reach your heart. I want to tell you, that's not me. That's the Holy Spirit use, uh, using the word of God to reach your heart. Paul didn't conceal his past, as I talked about. And so it's all by grace. When you are filled with grace, there is nothing about your life that God cannot use for his glory. I remember um, preaching the first time back where I went to high school and all of the people that went to school with me um, now with Facebook, they see it on Facebook all of the time. They say, is that the same guy that I went to school with? Um, Rusty Miller lives here in Cove. Tanya and I went to high school with Rusty. And uh, what they'll often say is, look at the difference. I want to tell you, it's not anything except what God can do in a person's life. I'm not ashamed of who I was, but I'm certainly not ashamed of what God is doing. Listen to Romans chapter 8. I've, I've got a couple of verses in here. Romans 8, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're living by your own strength, 
if you're living in a prayerless kind of way, if you're just going through the motions, I want to tell you, God will never use that. Because God needs the glory. And he gets the glory for his word. In Romans chapter 10, um, the Bible is going to tell us the only way we can please God is to submit to that authority. The authority of God in our lives. It, this is part of the salvation verse, the verses we share when we're sharing our faith with someone. When we want to see them come to Christ, we share this verse, Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you will be saved. King James, shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We have a part when we, when we accept the Lord, when we receive the Lord. But I want to tell you, God is the one who gets all of the glory. In Ephesians chapter 2, I've mentioned this when I started, by grace you are saved through faith, it's not of yourselves. Now, I want you to notice something about that verse. That's Ephesians 2, verse 8 through 10. We often quote the first part, by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But I want you to look at verse 10, because this is the part many people leave out. I'm saved by grace. I'm only here today by grace. You're only here today by grace. We're going to heaven because of God's grace. But let me finish. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Turn to your neighbor and say, that means God's working on me. Yeah. We are his workmanship. God is the workman, and we are what he is working on. God is working on you. Now, now notice this, your purpose. You're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I'm not saved by my good works, but I'm God's workmanship. By grace I'm saved, but God is working on me. And the purpose of it, God has a plan, God has a purpose, and you are his creation and he's created you in Christ Jesus unto good works, underline this part, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, friend, I want to tell you, that's, that last statement is the expectation of all believers using their spiritual gift to serve the Lord. Paul's testimony is a testimony filled with grace. It's filled with thanksgiving. He gives God all the glory. He doesn't conceal his past, and he uses it again for the glory of God. Now, that's um, one part of grace, but now I, I, I want you to see the abundance. Many, many times people think grace is for the front, but it has no purpose in the middle or in the end. And I want to tell you, grace goes through and through. In verse 14, he says, The grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. When Paul talks about being the chief sinner, I want to tell you, he never forgot who he once was. He never forgot the pain that he caused the Lord. He probably wanted to forget the pain that he caused people, those early Christians like Stephen. Maybe some of that haunted him at some point, but it was by grace that he could understand that all of that was on the part of me. It was ignorance on the part of me of who he was in Christ. You know, I'm fascinated with how God saved the Apostle Paul. I, we often forget this. When Paul gets saved on the Damascus Road, he's blinded, literally, by the Lord. Um, and he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you persecute. And, and, and he's blinded, and he's told to go into town, and he stays at a person's house, and God sends another person to him. And, he tell, and, and, and number one, you can imagine what this other saint decided. 
this is the same Saul who's murdering people, and now God tells him, I want you to go to his house. <laughs> Whoa, wait a minute. It took great courage, didn't it, for some of these people to, to go. And, and so he, 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 he obeys, and he goes, and, and God does a work in, in Saul's life. He becomes Paul. But when Paul went off to study the Word of God, to, to be made the man that God's going to make out of him, for three years... Uh, in a deserted place, God begins to work on the Apostle Paul. When he goes, all he has is an Old Testament in his heart, in his hand, all he knew. The reason he persecuted Jesus, because he saw Jesus as a blasphemer, saying he was God. Understand that this is the same Paul who goes off for three years w with nothing but the Old Testament part, uh, and, and he couldn't see Jesus. When he comes back, all he can see is Jesus in every scripture. It's an amazing transformation. Grace causes you to believe all of the things which you had trouble before. Grace causes you to love people, to love things that you once hated. Grace, grace will bring a change in your life. It's complete and it's eternal. I'll close like this. I'm out of time, but I want you to see this pattern. The pattern of grace is found in verse 16. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all patience for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life. The way God saved Paul is the way he saves us. He saved us for a pattern. He saved you, maybe for a son or a daughter. He's brought you to this place. He's going to use your life as an example. And, and, and God still works this way. He puts our lives on display before a lost and dying world. And just like the Apostle Paul says, if God can do this for me, he can also do it for you. I've often thought of Christians, uh, especially those I have looked up to. Through the, I, I've always looked up to my grandpa. Um, and my grandmother, I was telling someone that testimony, uh, I'll just close with a little bit of it. But uh, when I was called to preach, I thought the first thing I'll do is I'll go to Charles Ladd, who's my father. And, and you have to know Charles Ladd, he's in heaven now, but he, he could be a little grouchy. I don't know where it came from. But, you know. Tanya says I got a little of that too, but that. Uh, just a little. But I figured I, I, I'll just go talk to Charles Ladd, my dad, because when I tell him I'm being called to preach, he'll tell me how dumb that is. I went and told my dad in East Texas underneath a big pin oak tree. You know what a pin oak tree is? It's one of our favorite places down there. And I got under that tree, and I told Dad I need to talk to him. And I told him, I thought I was being called to preach, and I expected him to look at me and say, boy, that's crazy or something, you know. I don't know. But his head went straight to the ground. And when he looked up, he had tears in his eyes. And he said, son, I too was called to preach at about your age. But I turned it down. And for the first time in my life, I began to understand my dad. He was a good man. He got a little bitter sometimes. But he shared with me about what it is to walk away from the call God has on your life. And later, later he would give to me a handwritten note from my grandmother who prayed that one of her children or grandchild would be called to preach the gospel. And that, that note had been written years before, years before. I want to tell you, it's by grace we are saved. But it's by grace you are sitting here this morning. And it's by grace that God can use you. God can accomplish in you something that is marvelous, something that is magnificent. And I want to tell you, 
Uh, in Ephesians 2.10, it says, I am his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto these good works, which God hath before ordained. That means God has them planned. God has it. God sees it like it's right now. And he's calling you and he's calling me. Uh, Jesus himself said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let's all stand as the musicians come forward. I'm calling you. I'm, uh, I'm giving you this opportunity as God has given it to me to respond to God's grace. Um, I don't know what tomorrow holds. I have every day that goes by, less and less do I have confidence in this world. Amen? My confidence is in the Lord. And God knows uh, what tomorrow holds. If you're here this morning and you need to respond, you come as the Holy Spirit calls. You come and respond to his grace.